Hey, thanks for joining us online, artists and family. We're so grateful that you would take this time and watch a message. Uh, we just wanna let you know about a couple things. Number one, uh, we've got tons of opportunities this summer for community at Artisan. So we'd encourage you, there's a link down below in the bio that'll take you to our calendar and you can check, up every, check out everything coming up, whether it be kids socials or socials for artists and women, whatever. If you're in the area, we'd love for you to check that out. In addition, if Artisan Church is a blessing to you, we'd love to invite you to practice generosity financially. There's a link below as well for that. Otherwise, here's a great message from Pastor Sam Grasso. Uh, week one, I talked about Get Planted, and I actually had sort of a viney bush up here, and we actually talked about the difference between being potted or being planted. What does that look like? And getting planted, and once you're planted, you start to grow. And if you're growing, you got to get pruned, and there's got, Jesus is going to work some things out of your life. There's going to be some pruning so that inevitably you can produce good fruit. And I loved where that message ended, and it's been in my heart, and I keep thinking about it, this idea that if we are doing the right things, and we are doing the hard work of being planted, getting pruned, we are naturally going to produce fruit. We don't need to stress. We don't need to coerce. We don't need to manipulate fruit into existence. It literally will just come out of you naturally. If you are a healthy tree, you will produce good fruit because you will do what you are designed to do. And you were designed to produce good fruit, fruit of the Spirit. But there was another aspect that I almost put in there that would have made the message a good hour-long message. And so I didn't put it in there, but I just it's just been burning in my spirit. I just felt like, man, we, we got to talk about it. And another aspect is, is, yes, you've got the planning, you've got the pruning, but really the question, if you think about the life of a plant, another question to ask is, what are you feeding the plant? What is the plant feeding on? What is the state of the soil? What are the nutrients in the soil? Is it getting enough sunlight? Is it getting enough of the sun moving over it? And also, is it getting enough water, right? In the first service, I was like, what's the third thing that plants need? And people were like, they couldn't think of it. I'm like, water. Plants need water. Um, so if you don't know, if you have plants, you got, you got to water them. Especially when we're in a drought, water your plants, okay? That's why they're turning brown and sad and dead. But, we, but you need to think about, what am I feeding this plant? What is this plant consuming? And is it going to be healthy for it so that it produces, again, healthy fruit? And so really this week is going to be a bit of a part two from that message. If you missed it, you can go back and rewatch it later. But we're going to dive into this question of what in our life, if we are the plant, if, if we're trying to produce good fruit, what in your life are you consuming? What are you feeding on? What are you eating? What are you putting in yourself? And this is a, a tension that Jesus addressed in John chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 47 for our main text today. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to start this one with like a caveat here. Like you need to understand the text we're about to go into is not a popular passage to read in its entirety in church, okay? This is not a section that gets preached often, talked about often, because just like in his day when Jesus preached it, when you read it in its entirety and you just take it at face value, it can almost be confusing and almost be, if we're being really honest, like a little alarming like, um, excuse me, like, Jesus, would you, would you explain that, please? And here he delivers a message and a sermon that gets a lot of concern from his disciples, his followers, and those listening. It actually caused a lot of people to walk away from him. This message was so controversial that he actually lost the majority of his following, and he barely held on to his disciples. Anybody interested in what that would have done that? Let's go into it. Let's read it. So, we're going to start in verse 47 in John chapter 6, and if you don't know much about John chapter 6, or you think you don't, you do. Uh, within John chapter 6, you have the famous healing at the pool, or the, sorry, Jesus feeding the 5,000. You've got Jesus walking on water. You've got Jesus talking about being the bread of life. And here, the bread of life actually comes after the feeding of the 5,000, which is important. If you don't know, there was a miracle where Jesus just took a few loaves uh, and a few fish, and he fed 5,000 people with it. If you don't know, Jesus didn't often just do miracles for the sake of miracles. He would do a miracle, and then he would teach half it. And one of the things he was teaching with the 5,000 is, I'm going to feed you. I'm going to feed you. I want to feed you. 
and I want you to feed. This is where he builds to. I don't want you, though, just to, fit, to feed on loaves and fish that expire. He then dives into, I want you to feed on me. And that's where it starts to get weird for the onlookers. They're like, oh, what do you mean, feed on me? What are you saying, Jesus? So he says this, very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. I mean, you guys remember Exodus, where they were, uh, had an exodus from Egypt. They escaped. They were in the desert, and God provided for them manna. The manna is not just about the provision. There's also a message behind it. And part of it is that that type of sustenance, how many of you know it lasted for one day? If they tried to store the extra manna that fell from the sky, it would actually get maggots and it would get moldy. And this is an example that Jesus is now tapping into and he's saying, hey, that only lasted a day. It was temporary feeding, but I'm the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. And here he starts introducing this idea. They ate the man in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus is saying, this bread, I'm the bread of life, and it's my flesh. And so the Jews that were listening then began to argue sharply among themselves, when I think in a very natural way. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They immediately went very literal, very carnal, and they started to think, okay, hold on, what is he? Is this guy some sort of cannibalistic? Like we've heard mention of sort of culty cannibals. Like is, that, is this what Jesus is about? We knew it was too good to be true with this Jesus guy. Here it is. Here's the weird part. This is where it turns. This is where it gets strange. Like what is he talking about. And they start to argue, and they're kind of freaking out a little bit. And so naturally, I can imagine, I, I like putting myself in the shoes of the disciples, and the disciples are like, okay, yeah, but it's Jesus. He'll fix this. Just wait. He's going to flip it on them, and he's going to fix it. And he's going to make it really, really simple. And then all these followers, they're going to stay. We're not going to lose anybody. We're not going to lose anybody. So Jesus spoke up in the midst of their confusion. And he said to them, very truly, I tell, to, tell you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. So he doesn't stop at flesh. Now he's going to blood. And if you know anything about the Jews, blood was a no-go. Okay? It was a symbol of, hey, the, the Passover lamb's blood, the sacrificial blood, had its use to go over the doorpost. But you, how you handle blood, what you touch with blood... You definitely don't drink blood. They had all these rules around animals. So all of a sudden now Jesus, he just drops like an anvil on the conversation. And he's like, and unless you eat his flesh and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Now, for those of you who heard the Get Planted sermon, this is where it starts to make a lot of sense. Do you remember where he says, I am the true vine and you are the branches. Remain in me, right? For life, that gives you life. Realize the bread and the blood, the bread of life and the blood of Jesus, what he's saying is the same illustration as the vine and the branches. It's no different, it's metaphorically. And he's saying, hey, I, if you would consume this, if you would feed on this, it's going to actually give you life. If you would eat this, it's going to remain in you, and I will remain in you as well. Now, in them, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one, so the one who, uh, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, "This." is a hard teaching who can accept it. Can I get an amen? <laughs> this is a hard teaching. I love when humanity is shown in scripture, right? You're like, that's just a human trying to figure this out. Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Like Peter James, does this offend you? 
then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? How many of you know they get to do that later? The Spirit gives life, but the flesh counts for nothing. Here we get another layer to this message. The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. If you would remain in me, if you would remain in the Spirit, if you would feed on the things of Spirit, you would get life. But if you feed the desires of your flesh, it will lead to nothing. All of a sudden, it's starting to make sense. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and of life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer wanted to follow him. So here he goes. He drops this message. This is before he gives a live illustration of him dying on the cross. This is before the Last Supper where he gives us communion. This is before those moments and there's some confusion. But he's okay with them wrestling with this. He's okay with dropping this and seeing how they would react. And I read a lot of commentaries and did a lot of study on this text to make sure I would do it good justice today. And one of the things, a quote that I found that helps to break this down is from Charles Spurgeon. And I want to read this. It's going to be up on the screen. He said this, do not any of you interpret this teaching. He was talking about this exact section of scripture in John chapter 6. Do not any of you interpret this teaching of Christ as the Jews did after a carnal fashion and fancy that we literally eat the flesh and drink the blood of Christ when we come to the communion table. The Lord's Supper was not instituted at the time that our Savior spoke these words. And he was speaking of quite another matter. Let's look at this last part. The spiritual reception of Christ, the real and true feeding by faith with our spirit upon the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what he's actually talking about. He's talking about the spiritual reception of Christ, inviting him into our life, accepting the eternal salvation that he offers as a free gift for us, and the real and true feeding, the subsequent feeding of our faith with our spirit upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He then summarizes it, and he says this, Jesus is that bread which feeds the spiritual life and sustains the everlasting life. He is the very bread that feeds our spiritual life and sustains our everlasting life. It's a both and. He's not just talking about getting your eternity set. Jesus actually called himself the daily bread for a reason, because you are to feast on him daily. He wants to become the daily sustenance. He wants to become the daily thing that we go to, that we turn to. That's why I love that he illustrates this passage and this idea with what are you feeding on. Because how many of you guys are all ready to feed on your second meal of the day? You're like, lunch is coming. Praise God for it. And, it, and you're already thinking about it. And something's turning in your stomach and you're like, pastor, I mean, you better stay on time today because I am hungry and I'm going to welcome home lunch simply because there's Chipotle because I need to be fed. Feed me. One meal never is never, ever enough. In fact, we finish a meal. What do we think about? Dessert. What am I having for dessert? Then what do we think about? What's my, what are we having for dinner? We just had lunch. What are we having for dinner, though? My kids can't even go an hour without asking for a snack. They're always hungry. They are a bottomless pit, and they're just, nom, 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 more food, food, food. We always think, what am I feeding myself with? And church, Jesus illustrates, and he's saying, hey, I actually want you to have an insatiable appetite for me. I want you to, when you get in my presence, have such a desire, grow, and build that you're just thinking about the next time you can get in my presence, that you're just thinking about the next time you can get close to me, the next time you can get around. I want you to get this appetite for me. I want you to get hungry for me. So the feeding here in John 6 is the words of Jesus feeding our faith, our spirit, and bringing us life. Remember what he said, the words I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life. His very words. Why are we doing a series about the words of Jesus? Because it is full of the spirit and it's full of life. 
And the life that he offers us is more abundant. He offers us this incredible life with him, but it is not, it is the daily bread. It is the thing we need to keep going back to and keep growing in our appetite of. We need more of Jesus. He's not offering himself as merely a one-time feast, but a constant supply of true nourishment for our life. The daily bread. I love um, one of my favorite texts to read often when I would be mentoring or pastoring, especially young people, always trying to, uh, right, sort of this, this natural instinct when you're young is you're always pushing the boundaries. Like, how far is too far? Like, can you draw a line for me, Pastor Sam? Or like, or if there's been boundaries set, I'm going to go just like a little bit past it and see how people react, right? Like, I'm just going to push it. I'm just going to see how far I can get with this. Well, there's a great text that the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and Corinth was the type of environment where they were always trying to figure out, how can I actually listen to the desires of my flesh more. It's a very pleasure-driven society, very flesh-driven. What what do I want? What do I desire? And the Apostle Paul wrote to them in the area of sexual immorality. He said, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. Another translation says, everything can be permissible, but not everything is beneficial. You say that you have the right to do it, but it's not beneficial. I have the right to do anything you say, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. This whole section of scripture that Paul wrote, this letter to the church, he was really trying to break down and help them to understand, hey, actually, your, your body, when when, when you accepted Jesus, do you remember he said, take up your cross and follow me? He, he actually said, I need you to lose your life in order to find it. I actually want you to lay down your body. I want you to give up your agency of your body and say, hey, actually, I'm going to lay this down. I'm going to lay down the desires that I feel, and I'm going to work towards building up my spirit and denying my flesh. And so actually, you can argue, no, oh, but it's, it's all right. It's not a big deal. Like, it's okay. And what I've found for me in my life is every time, I'm try- every time I'm trying to convince myself that it's okay, it's probably the very thing that God's asking me to lay down. Like, if we are having to work really, really hard to convince ourselves and everybody around us that it's good for us, it's probably not good for you, right? There's this reality. We will work so hard to be like, but just not that. Just not that. Anything goes, but not that. And we want to withhold. We want to argue, it's okay, I have the right, I have the right, I have the right. Jesus here is inviting us to start to challenge that thinking of, okay, maybe I have the right, but is it beneficial? Let's go back to it. What is it going to produce? What's the end result? Have you played it through to to the end? Have Have you thought it through? You see, there's this conversation I've been having now with a lot of people in a counseling or mentorship type environment where I'm sitting down and we're talking about their life, naturally our society makes us think about what we want to do in the future. Okay, well, what are you going to do when you're 20? What are you going to do when you're 30? What are you going to do when you're 40, 50, 60? What are we going to do in the future? What do I want to do, 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 do? Job, title, work, effort, things I want to do, experiences I want to have. That's the question. Anybody ever had a grad party? Well, what are you going to do now? Like, over and over and over. and over. It just comes out. Like, it's the only question we ask. What a terrible question. Let me give you a better question. Who do you want to become? So, so when you turn 30, who, who, who do you want to be by then? Who do you want to become? What version of yourself are you trying to become? Do you even have a picture or a vision of who God made you to be? Like, do you have a clear picture of, like, I want to be the best version of myself that I can be according to how God made me? Do do you trust the creator enough that he knows what you're capable of producing and that it's so much more and better than what you're producing right now? And that actually if he's inviting us to feed on him, that maybe if we would consume more of him, we would produce healthier fruit because we would be a healthier plant. The byproduct of a healthy plant is healthy fruit. I want to challenge us with an idea. 
What if you are becoming what you are consuming? What if you are becoming right now what you are consuming? All the different things you're taking in, all the different things you're consuming, what if it's actually determining your outcome? Remember again, John 6, just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. The Spirit gives life, but the flesh counts nothing. Spirit gives life, but the flesh counts for nothing. When I give in to all the desires, all those things, it ultimately amounts to nothing. Can you see where it's headed? Can you see what it's going to produce down the road? Can you get a vision and a picture? Because there's something so incredible. Like right now, I'm working on it. I'm, I'm asking myself this question. God, who am I supposed to be at 40? When my kids are all in high school and going off to college, who am I supposed to be? Show me, help me to understand who you made me to be because I got to do the work. I remember, let me get vulnerable. I didn't even say this in the first service. I feel led. Maybe this will encourage somebody. I feel the Holy Spirit leading me to share this. I remember in my 20s, and we, we, we got pregnant. And one of the biggest issues of my early 20s was anger. It was a really big issue in my life. Like I just, I could fly off the handle and I was kind of that personality. Really short patience and then could have a high temper. And I remember starting to actually gain some healthy fear of this when I started to paint a picture in my mind of like, I can't be that dad. I can't be that dad that flies off the handle. I cannot be the screaming father. But guess what? I need, there's going to be some work. And I started to get a picture in my early 20s of who I needed to be in my 30s. And I'm like, I'm going to need to be a more patient man. <laughs> like I need to become, I need to produce patience. But I can't just tell myself to not be angry in the moments when I feel angry. I have to do something preemptively. I need to consume more of Jesus, build more of him into my life so that naturally I produce patience later on and down the road when my kid is crazy. Because let me tell you, your kids will be crazy sometimes. And they'll make you think you're crazy. And they'll make everybody feel crazy. And everything gets crazy. But what I don't want to come out of me in those moments is anger. And I don't get it right all the time. I'm not perfect. But can I tell you, I am not controlled by anger anymore in my life. It's something I've outgrown. Something I know and I can see the signs and the early signals and I know what I need to do and I've worked so hard. Why? Because I got a picture of if I keep fueling this, I know the dad I'm going to become. I know that dad and I cannot afford to be that dad. I've counseled way too many teenagers who've had that dad. I can't be that dad. And so I need more of Jesus because guess what? Again, the way, how do you beat something like anger? It's not just by starving anger, it's by feeding on Jesus. See, for a lot of us, it's like, well, I'll just starve that thing. I'll just starve that thing. No, you want to know what happens when all you do is starve it? It just gets really crabby, and it comes up way uglier and way worse down the road. You starve it for a season, and when it comes up, it comes up rearing its head, letting everybody know that you didn't deal with it. Now, I can't just starve this. I also need to feed on Jesus. I need to replace it. I need to go to Jesus and say, you are the bread of life. And I'm going to consume you on a daily basis. You are my daily bread. You are new every morning. There is something fresh. I want an appetite for you. I'm going to crank through just three just applications. This will just help us even maybe start to break it down. Maybe it's not anger for you. Maybe it's something else. But I actually have to, we have to address our inputs if we're going to make adjustments on our outputs. What am I consuming? If I'm becoming what I'm consuming, well, let's just talk about it. How do you consume things? The same parts of your body that can be used to consume things of Jesus and of his spirit can also consume things of darkness and evil and of the flesh, right? So my eyes, let's take our eyes. What, I'll ask you this question. What are my eyes seeing right now? What are my eyes seeing? What have I seen this week? What have I looked at? What have I taken in? Do you realize how much work our eyes are doing without us realizing it? 
Like, think of how much watching you've done since coming into this service. Like, oh my gosh, how did they worship? They worship that way? Like, I don't know if I would do that, but I'm going to do this, and I don't know. Oh, that's distracting. Why'd that person leave? What's going on there? We're just looking around the room. Why are they in my seat? I'm watching them. Well, who are they anyways? And we just watch. We watch. We watch. Where's my people watchers at? You go to the mall, and you're like, I can just sit on a bench in the mall, and I'm good. I will hang here, and I will watch all day long. I don't need to buy a thing. There's enough entertainment here. Who needs Hollywood? Go on strike, people. It's fine. I got the Mall of America, and I can people watch for days. We watch, we watch, we watch. But have you ever asked yourself the question, what am I watching? What am I watching? Think about this. There's this amazing passage in Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 through 23. It says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. This doesn't get talked about enough, does it? Wait, what? My eyes can either lead to my whole body being full of light or full of darkness? Pastor Tim, that's pretty dramatic. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Because you have consumed so much darkness with your eyes. Now think about it. Those words were spoken in a society, in a world that had a lot less to look at. You thought about this? There was just a lot less to look at. There was less people in the world. There was less buildings. There was less places to go. There was less content on the internet. There was less movies. There was less TV. There was a lot less to look at. And yet even then, you go as far to say as your eyes are letting in either light or darkness, and it will fill your whole body with what you consume with them. How much time and thought are we giving to what we are watching Let me say it really simply. We need to watch what you watch. Watch what you watch. Am I watching this? Am I thinking about it? And often we say the phrase, I want to see more of God in my life. What a great phrase. I want to see more of God in my life. Okay, what are you looking at? What do your eyes have an appetite for? Are you actually looking for God all day long? God, I'm looking for you. I'm looking for an opportunity to pray. I'm looking for an opportunity to connect. I'm looking for where you're showing up. I'm looking for an opportunity to parent a little bit better. I'm looking. What am I looking for? Am I actually, I want to see more of God. Then look for him because he's all over. He is all over. He's in creation. He is screaming to you. He is speaking to you through the people in your life, through your family, through your friends. What are you looking at? Maybe there's some things that we need to stop watching so that we can start watching more of Jesus, looking for more of him in our life. Watch what you watch. Another thing, what are your ears hearing? What are my ears hearing? What am I listening to? Again, I want to produce good fruit, but I got to care about that input. What am I listening to? I've read this text before. I'll probably read it like every couple months in today's society because we always need to remember it. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 through 4. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. You feel like we're there? I think we might be there. I think that time's come. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Essentially, doesn't this kind of paint the picture of like a group of people funding an individual to go on a stage and say what they want them to say? Kind of sounds like that, doesn't it? Hey, you go be our spokesperson and go say what we want people to be saying. We'll fund it. We'll get behind it. We'll rally around it. Go say what we want to say. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Turn aside to myths. There's a lot of myths out there. You can go chasing a lot of rabbit trails these days. A lot of myths, a lot of truth that people are turning away from. Because itching ears, that almost makes it sound like our ears have an appetite, doesn't it? Like itching ears want to hear. What am I trying to hear? And what am I just tuning out? We can learn to tune things out. Come on again, parents. How many of you know, I was just talking to a new family in the lobby after the first service, and their kids were just kind of milling around a little while. And she was like, oh, I'm just so sorry that they're like being loud. I'm like, I literally didn't even notice. Like, I'm immune. I'm just immune to like loud kids milling around. Like, it's just normal. Like, I've tuned it out. Like, it's fine. It's not a big deal, right? Because you just get used to it. Or how many of you know the appetites of your ears can change? 
I remember a little stretch late on in high school where I got really into screamo music. This is like a hard thing for me to admit, okay? Like I'm talking like for real, and I'd go to screamo shows and go into the mosh pits, and we'd do circle mosh. We were throwing punches. I mean, it was aggressive. People were getting knocked out, and apparently I had some like aggression I had to deal with after I quit hockey. I don't know. Like, and that's where I found it was in a screamo, and I remember saying stupid things like, this is true art and passion. Look, they're just letting out their real selves. You know, like this is, this is what this is. And I had a passion. And it was like, I liked how it sounded. And now I go back and I listen to it. I'm like, are you kidding me? Instead, give me indie folk music on a hill with a view and a cup of coffee with my Patagonia on. And I am good. Like that is my type of music. Why? Because it's changed. My appetite for what I'm listening to has changed. You can adjust what your ears have an appetite for, church. We can adjust it. Do we have an appetite for truth or do we have an appetite for myths and lies and conspiracy theories and manipulation? I got to change. Do we have an appetite for gossip? Do we have an appetite for slander? What do we have an appetite to listen to? What podcasts are you listening to? Listen, there's so, there's so much good content out there. The, well, the one thing with how much content, there's challenges with it, but there's also some amazing things. I love listening to long-form, healthy conversations on podcasts. What am I taking in in my ears? Last one is the band comes on up. What is my mouth consuming? And um, this is the one that we justify really easily, whether it's some type of substance or drink or food that we have an inappropriate behavior with. This is the one where we really fight for like, no, 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 I have the right for this. I have the right for this. This is okay. This is okay because at least it's not that. At least it's not that, and so this is okay. And uh, I really think that what we are consuming in our mouth affects us more than we realize, what we are taking in. It's one of the ways that we have inputs. We're taking things in. Romans 12.1 reminds us, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Remember what I said at the beginning, we're, we're laying down that agency over our bodies. From head to toe, God, I want every part of me to be an instrument for your kingdom. I want it to be about building your kingdom of light, not building the kingdom of darkness. So everything. I want to lay it down. I want to, I want to use it properly. I want to use it in a healthy way. And that includes my mouth. It includes my ears. It includes my eyes. What am I consuming? What am I taking in? I want to make some adjustments where I need to make adjustments. I want my body to be a sacrifice to you, God. Because the flesh amounts to nothing. The spirit gives life, but the flesh counts for nothing. So what am I consuming? You know, it's one of the reasons, I think, when it comes to what we consume with our mouth, why fasting can be so valuable. Because there's this denial of food to realize just how much Jesus can feed you. It helps you realize, wow, when I deny the food and I build this appetite for the things of Jesus, I watch how much he can care for me and love me and take care of me. But I think that anything in life has a hold on some part of your body. That you're, you have a desire and you've been feeding this thing, and it's unhealthy. Maybe it's with your eyes, your ears, your mouth. Toxic relationship that you have with your flesh. One of the things Jesus constantly invites us to is to deny that. To starve that so that you can feed on Jesus and you can grow this appetite for who he is. Sometimes the challenge that pastors receive sort of the rebuttal to sermons like this, sort of the, the thing that people come and maybe attack a pastor with on this is, well, pastor, don't you know? That's legalistic. Jesus isn't legalistic. It's legalistic. You're just talking about do's and don'ts. What, what do you even mean? What do you mean? We're talking about the things I can do and can't do. That's legalism. And I think that that's such a low view of Jesus and it's such a toxic argument. And I want to break it down because the Rebuttal is, Jesus, he's not legalistic, and he doesn't have do's and don'ts. He just wants relationship. And I go, yes, yes, there it is, okay. Does he want a healthy or unhealthy relationship? Well, he wants a healthy relationship. Okay, okay, great, let's hold that thought. So Jesus wants a healthy 
relationship with me. So if it's healthy, do you think he would let me know if something I'm doing is hurting me? Well, I mean, I guess. Yeah. Because a healthy relationship is going to say, hey, don't do that. Do you know where that leads? It produces nothing. You're wasting your time. I know who you could be when you're 40. I know who you could be when you're 50. I know who you could be. Your, I could get to see where you're going. And this is going to cost you your marriage. This is going to cost you that child. You know, I'm a good friend. I'm a good relationship. I'm going to let you know. And Jesus, he is not legalistic. He did die so he can have a relationship with you. But a right relationship where he's not afraid to say something that makes most of the room leave. No, I, you got to daily bread. Feed on my words. Feed on me. Realize what I want to produce in you. You see, if it were legalism, legalism would be Jesus demanding obedience for the sake of control. You must obey because I want to control you. I got my finger on you and I, I'm going to control you. <laughs> church. If God wanted more control, he could just take it. It's not legalistic. Law is maintaining order and control. Jesus' guidance isn't for his control. It is for our health. And so there is guidance. There is challenging words that say, you know what? You've been consuming something that is feeding your flesh, which counts for nothing. I want to feed your spirit. I want to feed your soul. I want to build that person up because I know who I made you to be. I know how I created you. I know you. So I want to lead to your health. Leave that out for just a second. So the only way this message has power is if you believe that following the words of Jesus would be healthy. If you don't think it's going to be healthy, you don't think it's going to amount to anything, I don't, whatever, don't do it. Keep trying your flesh. See where that gets you. But you're in church. So there's some part of you somewhere that knows that the way of Jesus is better. Deep down inside. That he's only going to lead you to the things that are for your good. But it comes with a sacrifice. No longer do we argue, I have no right to do that. No. Say, you know what? This isn't, if this isn't beneficial, God, get rid of it. All of it, anything, it's all on the table. Take what you want. Use me. Take what you want. I'll cut it. I'll, I'll trim it. Use me. Church, he wants our best. So I give over my flesh willingly to God, and I allow him to challenge me in all areas. Anything can come and go. It's so vital in a life of faith that my, the desires of my flesh do not become my identity. I cannot wrap up who I am in little meaningless desires. Why? Because desires are fickle and they change. I used to desire Jack's pizzas and Eggo waffles every single day. I don't anymore. <laughs> my body can't handle that kind of diet anymore. I don't desire that anymore. Was that an identity thing? No, it's, desires aren't identity. Identity is found in Jesus. When we desire him and we feed on him, he begins to bring that out.